In this video, we will talk about Clostridioides difficile. I know what you guys are thinking. You're like, finally, we made it through all of the different cocci, and you're absolutely correct. So if you're going in order, the last video was the final video about the cocci species. And now we're gonna start to talk about another gram-positive species, and we'll talk about all of the different bacilli. Now I wanna pause for a second and be clear that when I say bacilli, what I'm really referring to is anything that's rod-shaped. So you see that just like I had the purple spherical cocci picture in that heading, I also have that brown cylindrical rod-shaped shape in the bacilli heading. And I say this because when we subdivide bacilli, we're gonna do it into three categories. We're gonna talk about the clostridium or the clostridioides, we're gonna talk about bacillus, and then we're gonna talk about other. And technically, clostridioides and clostridium are not in the genus of bacilli, but they are in fact rod-shaped. So when I say bacilli as that greater heading that you see there with the brown rod-shaped image flanked on either side, what that really should say is rod-shaped. So in this video, we're gonna to start to talk about our first species. And before we get there, I wanna show you how to make a conceptualization of what types of pathogens fall under this rod-shaped category. And I've broken it down for you by color. So the first category shown in red is our clostridium or our clostridioides. The second heading shown in blue is the bacillus or the bacilli. And then finally in green, we've got other. And under each of these, we've got quite a few pathogens that we'll talk about. So the next several videos, we'll start with Clostridioides difficile, but we'll also talk about Clostridium perfringens, Clostridium tetani, Clostridium botulinum. Then we'll move over to the bacilli subheading shown in blue. Again, we'll talk about Bacillus anthracis and Bacillus cereus. And then we'll conclude with those pathogens shown in green in our other. So these are our other rod-shaped organisms. We'll talk about Listeria and we'll talk about diphtheria. But today's video is on Clostridioides difficile and we'll get started with that today. So this is a gram-positive anaerobic rod-shaped bacterium that's normally found in the GI tract. And I think most of you already have a suspicion about what it is that C. diff really does. If you've never heard about C. diff before, then you should know that this causes an infectious hospital-acquired antibiotic-resistant post-antibiotic diarrhea. And more on that in just a bit. What's really high yield about Clostridioides difficile is the virulence factors. And there are two virulence factors that you need to understand and memorize, and I've got some easy mnemonics for both. So let's color code these to make it easier for you to see and memorize. We've got enterotoxin A shown in red and cytotoxin B shown in blue. Enterotoxin A binds to the intestinal brush border. And what it does is it facilitates the intracellular transport of both this toxin, enterotoxin A, but also of that cytotoxin B, which we'll talk about in just a few moments. Enterotoxin A inactivates row family proteins. And row family proteins, although you don't really need to get into the nitty gritty details, just for completeness sake, I'll mention that they have a supportive role in epithelial junctions and keeping cells tight and close to one another. And so when you inactivate that family of proteins, you lose the supportive role that those proteins play. And then you can think of those epithelial junctions as becoming somewhat leaky. And this collectively contributes to the diarrhea effect of C. diff. So enterotoxin A inactivates proteins that support the epithelium. Once the epithelium starts to leak, then fluid balance and exchange cannot be done adequately and you get the incorrect movement of fluids, which leads to diarrhea. So that's enterotoxin A. Cytotoxin B depolymerizes actin cytoskeleton. And when you depolymerize actin, then of course actin can't function in its normal structural way. And also the thing you wanna know about cytotoxin B is that this releases endosomal contents that are directly cytotoxic. And anything that's directly cytotoxic is obviously very damaging to nearby structures and cells, et cetera. So between these two toxins, you can start to get an idea and an understanding of how C. diff has its virulence. And the way that I want you to think about this is with two very helpful mnemonics. So for enterotoxin A, I want you to think intestinal brush border, enterocytes, and intracellular transport. This helps you remember that it binds to the intestinal brush border, that it directly attacks enterocytes, and that it causes intracellular transport of both toxins, which is very high yield. For cytotoxin B, I want you to think cyto, because it affects the cytoskeleton, and it sets its sites, 
on the endosome because it releases endosomal contents. So cytotoxin B, think cyt and cyto. Enterotoxin A, think ent. And this will help you remember some of the features of these various toxins. Now let's talk about the clinical features of C. diff. So the thing that C. diff is most known for is a post-antibiotic odorous watery diarrhea. Now, classically, this is highly associated with the use of clindamycin, but if you're taking USMLE, Comlex, or any other in-class exam, they could give you any antibiotic. So how this will appear to you in the clinical vignette is that they're going to describe a patient who gets sick and is started on an antibiotic. And initially, when you're reading the question, you're going to think that the question is going to ask you something about the sickness that they describe, right? The disease, the illness, or the antibiotic that they're started on. And then after the question tells you the, the course of what happened, they're going to say, uh, two to 10 days later, the patient started to develop watery diarrhea. And what they're getting at here is that the patient was started on an antibiotic, and then the antibiotic altered that person's gut flora and made it possible for C. diff to grow out of control. And when that happens, the patient's going to develop this voluminous, odorous, watery diarrhea. And there's this classic stench or odor associated with C. diff. And if you, if you see the question writer go after that and really talk about how the stool smells or how the diarrhea smells, they are screaming C. diff at you. So keep that in mind. Now, again, this is classically associated with the use of clindamycin, but you should remember that this can happen technically with any antibiotic. So if you see a patient on an antibiotic and then after they start the antibiotic, they start to get diarrhea, you need to start to think C. diff. Now, the other high yield clinical feature is this thing called pseudomembranous colitis. And I put a picture here so you can appreciate just how serious this is. Pseudomembranous colitis is, as the name implies, a pseudo membranous colitis. So it sort of looks like membranous colitis. So it, it resembles some other diseases which you should be familiar with if you've already gone through the GI section. The thing that's really high yield for exams is that this greatly increases the risk of two things. One, ileus, and two, toxic megacolon. So again, on your exam, if you see a patient that gets started on an antibiotic and then has these nonspecific but serious sounding GI symptoms, you want to start to think about pseudomembranous colitis caused by C. diff. Now, some of the buzzwords that they could give you are things like pseudomembranous plaques on the colonic mucosa, or they could even talk about fibrin exudation. Either one of those things in any order should make you think of pseudomembranous colitis. Obviously, if you see this image, think of C. diff. Now, let's talk about how you make this diagnosis. This has somewhat changed over the years in terms of what the recommendation is, so be sure to read up on some primary literature to see if this recommendation changes after I post this video. But... If you want to confirm the diagnosis of C. diff, you want to use something with a high sensitivity. And so if they want you to pick something with a high sensitivity, the answer is enzyme immunoassay for C. diff GDH, which stands for glutamate dehydrogenase. But if you're looking for something with a high specificity, you want to use PCR for the C. diff stool toxins. So what this means for you if you're taking an exam like USMLE or Comlex, and this is more true of step two, level two and beyond, you want to choose the initial test with a high sensitivity so that you can capture most of the true positives. And so if you get a question that has both of these answer choices as possible choices, you're going to want to pick enzyme immunoassay, again, because of a high sensitivity. Now, generally speaking, this is a, a bit of an aside here, but this is good to keep in mind for step two, level two and beyond. These tests do not want you to overorder. They don't want you to practice defensive medicine on paper. So they don't want you to order expensive tests that are unnecessary and that have overly high specificity. If there's an option to pick an answer that is somewhat cheaper or relatively cheaper and has a high sensitivity, that's going to be the correct answer. And that's more true of those questions which say things like which of the following is the next best step or which of the following is the best way to confirm the suspected diagnosis, et cetera, et cetera. I know that was an aside, but I point that out because at some point that will become very relevant for you. Let's talk about treatment. So treatment really depends for C. diff, whether it's the first episode or whether it's recurrent C. diff. And again, just like the previous discussion, these recommendations have been changing over the past several years. So if it's a first episode C. diff, you want to use either oral vancomycin or oral fidaxomycin. The way that I want you to remember this is for the very first episode, VF, V for vancomycin, F for fidaxomycin. So very first episode, you use either oral V or oral F. 
But if it's recurrent C. diff, so you are patient, the patient on the test keeps getting C. diff, it's like the second or third time, then presumably you've already tried oral vancomycin and it's not really working because the C. diff is recurrent. So at this point, you would use fidaxomycin, and then if that didn't work, you would use rifaximin. So the mnemonic here is for future recurrences, you use FR, F for fidaxomycin, and then R for rifaximin. So keep these mnemonics in your pocket because these recommendations have been changing over the last four to five years. They make for really great test questions because a lot of the times medical students and other types of health graduate students they're not up to date on the new recommendations. They're still reading resources from like 2013. So don't, don't be that person. This is what you want to know for treatment. Um, this is as of the date of publishing this video. So these could change. These recommendations could change. But this is what it is as of today. So here's your summary slide. Um, the appearance, it's rod-shaped. The characteristics is C. diff is gram-positive anaerobic. Virulence factors, we talked about the two major toxins, enterotoxin A enters the enterocyte on the intestinal brush border and causes intracellular transport of both toxins. Cytotoxin B depolymerizes actin cytoskeleton and sets its site on endosomal contents. Remember that treatment really depends. Is it the initial episode? Is it the very first VF, Vank, Fidaxomycin episode? Or is it for future recurrences? FR, future recurrences, F for fidaxomycin, R for rifaximin. That is everything you need to know about C. diff.